Amen. Thank you, Polly. Well, hello again. My name is George Hinman. I want to introduce you to two friends today, two friends who are in conversation with one another between belief and unbelief. They're not sure. Now, this is a familiar place for me, and maybe it is for you as well. Certainly many of us, whether you're a church person or not a church person, sometimes we're just not sure. Um, that's the name of this new sermon series that we're beginning today, Not Sure. And I want to thank you for joining. We know that life gives us so many reasons not to believe, and yet here you are. If you're new, or maybe you're not a church person at all, maybe someone sent you a link or invited you to come. I think it says a lot about you that you'd be willing to join the conversation. And I just want to say thanks for being a part of this. I, I, uh, I have two goals for the series. One is to make space for our unbelief. I mean, yes, even in church. And the other is to try to be helpful with some of the questions that we sometimes ask when we think about faith. So let's talk. Uh, today, the idea is that we're not sure the New Testament is reliable. Not sure the New Testament is trustworthy. Now, I want to begin today by just reading from the New Testament. And you may go, oh, that's weird. I mean, would you ever ask the source whether it's trustworthy itself, it's a little circular, right? But just uh, bear with me for a moment. Um, we are going to look at the New Testament because I think it's interesting to hear two people who are in the New Testament talk about the trustworthiness of the New Testament. And, and besides, this is where I want you to meet the two friends that uh, I want to introduce to you today. So if you have a Bible, would you open up please, to the, kind of near the beginning of the, uh, the Bible, uh, the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. If you don't have a Bible and would like to follow along, we'll put the words on the screen. You can also navigate on a device to Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It's actually one sentence that starts the Gospel of Luke. And if you're able, would you stand with me? This is one of the things we like to do here. It's a way of honoring God. We read his word out loud together as an act of worship. So, uh, follow along, read along if you like, and when we're done, I'll say this is the word of the Lord so that if you believe it, you can say, thanks be to God. Listen closely, you're reading God's holy word. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided after investigating everything carefully from the very first to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but what you just read never will. Please be seated. Feel free to keep the book open. I'm going to refer to it again a little bit later on. But I want you to see right away, there are two friends here in conversation with one another, right? Um, Luke, I should have had two chairs here. Let's, so we have Luke sitting right here and we have Theophilus sitting right here. We have one who's writing, that's Luke, and another who's reading, that's Theophilus. One of them is uh, sitting in a place of belief. Another is sitting in a place of unbelief. But I want you to notice this right away. One of them is honoring the unbelief of the other. And the other is studying the belief of the other. So let's think about this for a second. I, I, I would love to invite you to think about the question, is the New Testament trustworthy? Uh, sitting in these two seats, if you would just for a minute sort of suspend your disbelief and sit with these two characters and raise the question from their perspective and see where that leads us. Because I, I, I think my, my contention here is that there's part of ourselves that each of these two people represent, right? That at, at, at any given point in time, you've got a little belief in you, like Luke. And, and then at the same time, maybe even you've got a little unbelief in you, like Theophilus, okay? So let's see what they have to, to share. Uh, first of all, let's start with Theophilus, this guy over here. Theophilus sits in unbelief. But what I want you to notice is that Luke honors his unbelief. Luke calls him most excellent Theophilus. 
Think about that. Most excellent Theophilus, the, the unbeliever. Now, there's a lesson for us in this, and it is this. Honor your own unbelief. Honor your own unbelief. Okay, let me back up for a second so you can see this more clearly. Who is Theophilus? We don't, we don't really know a lot about him. He's only mentioned here and in another document in the New Testament called the Book of Acts, which is also written by Luke. But the name, the title and the name do suggest some things. Theophilus, most excellent. That most excellent uh, could be translated noble. And so we think he might be a man of means. He might be a Roman official at the time, an important person in the government. Um, might be that he's actually a patron sponsoring the, the, the document that Luke is writing. Maybe he said, hey, would you produce this document? I'll pay for it and I'll publish it for you. Could be that that's who he is. But the most important thing you need to understand about Theophilus is he's not convinced. Not in this moment, is he? He's not convinced. He, he's, he's not come to know enough about Jesus to be able to say, I believe. You know, not yet. And I want you, with that knowledge, to understand and see how Luke honors him. Luke knows all about his unbelief, uh, but he says, most excellent Theophilus. And by the way, it's not just the way he refers to him, it's also the language that he uses. Uh, the tone of the language. It's very high academic Greek that Luke is using, which means he's saying, I'm writing for a man who's educated, who's thoughtful, who's informed. I'm writing a document that should stand on its own on the world stage, where, where uh, people who know things would respect it. So this is a way of honoring uh, Theophilus and others who will read this work, just the language that he uses. So I'm getting emails now from my family and text messages. I'm sorry, I'm just turning that off. Um, they're interested, right? They're curious. Uh, we all are. So uh, Theophilus has got a question about this Jesus thing and Luke is saying, uh, you know what, I honor that in you. And I ask myself, well, what does it mean that the very first followers of Jesus made space for unbelief? That they made space in the church for unbelief? They made space in their lives for their own unbelief. They actually honored it. I got an email from one of you recently, and thank you for permission to share this. Uh, you write, I'm a lifelong Lutheran and now Presbyterian Christian, uh, but I am having doubts during these exceptionally troubling times. My faith is being challenged in ways I would not have expected just a year ago. Is God still active in our world? The USA is becoming tribal without uh, common values. A pandemic and racial injustice is raging across the country. Climate change is becoming more and more evident and a significant part of the country denies science. So again, is God acting in our world? I still have the faith of a mustard seed, i.e. I'm hanging on. <laughs> you know, I like that. Is that enough, he writes. Is that enough? It's in interesting. Do you, do you feel that way at all in this moment? I, mean, I think many of us feel exactly that way, and I like the way he says it. I mean, we might use different words ourselves. We might say, oh, I don't have enough faith, or I wish I had your faith, or I'm losing faith. Some of the words that we use now, we say, well, I'm deconstructing my faith, or, or I'm deconverting. It's a lot of that. Now, Fleming Rutledge uh, says this. She said, we could, we could call ourselves faithful doubters or unbelieving believers. And I like that. See, this is where part of us sits here with Theophilus. And, and I think Luke would say, if you're sitting here with him, Luke would say to you, and I think he'd say to this person who sent me the email, most excellent friend. You feel the warmth of that? Most excellent friend. He's on, I, honor, I honor the question in you. I honor the questioner herself. Most excellent friend. So the point here is honor your unbelief. Okay, now what would that mean? What does it mean to honor your unbelief? Well, I would just say, first of all, it means don't scold it. Don't scold yourself or someone in unbelief. Don't scold. Honor means to recognize the weight. I use that word honor intentionally because it's a, the biblical language of honor and glory is the language of weight. Recognize that your doubt has weight. It's, it's substantial. It's, it's, it's weighty. It has influence 
in, in your life. You honor that and, and respect that because there's something about that unbelief in you that's tied to something important, something that is good, it is true. In many cases, that's, that's, that's what it is. That's why it's so important, valuable to you. So honor that unbelief. What does it mean? Well, it means to do essentially with your unbelief what Luke does with Theophilus, right? Uh, open a conversation. Talk to it. Engage it. Uh, but not in a debate kind of way, not the throw down kind of, but more to respectful, to understand and to appreciate and to talk with. So that's what we see uh, it means to honor our unbelief. I, it reminds me of an MIT astrophysicist uh, who was sitting in this place of unbelief. And you, you'd probably think, well, it's probably some intellectual problem. This guy's a scientist. Uh, but actually, what he learned when he got in conversation with his own unbelief is it wasn't actually an intellectual hang-up. <clears throat> it, was, it wasn't that he had a problem with Jesus. It's that he had a problem with Jesus' followers. You know, <laughs> It said he had a problem with me, you know, and maybe some of you as well. Because it turns out in his past, he had had a bad experience with, with a Christian, um, a nun actually. And, um, but as he talked about this, he realized, you know, why should I allow one bad experience or one bad follower of Jesus to kind of keep me from Jesus entirely? He goes, actually, they're, you know, they're good followers and bad followers, they're good nuns and they're bad nuns. And why should I let the bad nun win? I thought that was insightful. When he got that insight, he realized, oh, my unbelief isn't as influential as I thought it was. And he began to enter into a season of faith in his life. He actually became a, a priest, a Jesuit, uh, and a scientist. It's a fascinating story. I don't know if that'll happen to you or not, but it did to him. So you see, unbelief actually is a gift. It, it can actually be productive as it was in his life and will prove to be in Theophilus' life. Uh, it's how we cultivate belief to, to interrogate or, or converse with or dialogue with our unbelief. It actually, it's like the scientific method, right? It's part of how we learn. There's a, a, a thesis and we test it and we challenge it and we raise questions about it and we gain knowledge. And it's the same thing in our spiritual lives as well. There's a, there's a profession of faith, the Apostles' Creed or whatever, and you go, I don't know. And you ask questions about it and you begin to, to learn and grow and your spiritual life deepens. There was a conference at Yale recently and one of the presenters, a professor from Dartmouth, uh, who was a scientist also, uh, he had an analogy. The, the conference was on intellectual humility, how important intellectual humility is. And this professor said, you know, knowledge is like an island, uh, like a deserted island where, where the, what we know is the island and what we don't know is the, is the ocean. And he says, thing is, you know, our, our island is growing, but as the island grows, you know what else grows? The, the shore, the boundary, that place where what we know abuts what we don't know. And you know, that's really uncomfortable. It's why some of you students who say, well, I'm paying all this money. The more I learn, the less I seem to know, right? Have you ever had that experience? Well, it's true. And it's true in our faith as well. We wanna be people who learn how to live on the beach, to live on the shore between what we know and believe and what we're not sure about. And, and, and the zones that feel like doubt or mystery to us as well. It's actually productive and helpful to do that. So the point is, we need to honor our own unbelief. We, we, we need to sit where Theophilus sits and hear Luke saying, most excellent, Theophilus. So let us also sit there. But let us also sit where Luke sits, okay? I'm gonna make a transition. I wanna explore with you what it was like to sit where Luke sits and for us to think about our question today that way. See, because Luke sits in his belief, and notice this, as Luke sits in his belief, Theophilus studies Luke's belief. Theophilus takes up Luke's investigation. I have investigated, Luke says, probably at Theophilus' request. So, so let's back up for a second, okay? I want you to see this more clearly. Who is Luke? Well, obviously, he's a writer. We have his words here. Uh, writes the, gospel, the thing we call a Gospel of Luke and, and what we call the Book of Acts, although in neither case is Luke named. We've just pieced it together that he's the one who must have written it. 
And if that's true, by the way, Luke writes the majority of the New Testament. Did you know that? Most of us would think Paul, right? Or John? No, it's actually Luke. He writes 28% of the New Testament. And it was interesting, it was whereas Theophilus couldn't get to the place where he said, I believe, he was curious but not convinced. Luke, he says, I believe. He's moved from curious to convinced. So he's sitting in a place of belief. But Theophilus takes up Luke's investigation. So what we have here, and I know this is a little complicated, but let's follow me here. Luke is honoring unbelief in Theophilus and Theophilus is investigating belief in Luke. Okay, so let me give you my second lesson here. The first lesson is honor your own unbelief. The second lesson is investigate your faith. Because I'm asking myself, what does it mean that the very first followers of Jesus, when they were groping for faith, did not look inside of themselves, but they looked outside of themselves to history. For them, the most pressing question wasn't, what do I feel? (laughs) The most pressing question was, what actually happened? Right, in Galilee, in Judea, between 5 BC and AD 20. I mean, that's the target you really wanna focus on. And 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 they did, and so they do. So here's Luke, investigating everything from the very beginning. Carefully, he says, this is Luke's approach. Which, which brings us at last to, to this book, to the New Testament, and to us as modern people. Now, uh, I want to come back to our question of the day, which is, uh, you know, is the New Testament trustworthy? And we say, well, I'm not sure. And many great minds have said no. It's, it's not, and we, we want to honor that. And so they, there are a lot of people you could read that would say, no, it's not reliable. And one of them is a scientist, Christopher Hitchens. You, you know, uh, sadly, he passed away not too long ago, but he was a brilliant mind, and here's what he writes. He, he questioned the, even the existence of Jesus as a historical figure, but here's what he writes. Either the Gospels are in some sense literal truth, or the whole thing is essentially a fraud, and perhaps an immoral one at that. Well, it can, it can be stated with certainty and on, on their own evidence that the Gospels are most certainly not literal truth. It's an interesting argument. That means, he writes, that many of the sayings and teachings of Jesus are hearsay upon hearsay upon hearsay, which helps explain their garbled and contradictory nature. As he's writing in God is not great, how religion poisons everything. Now, I read those words with sympathy. There is, I don't agree, but there is something there that resonates with me. I mean, many of us have thought, have we not, that I wonder if the New Testament is kind of like that old game of telephone. You know, have you ever played that at a party where one person says something to the next person and the next person to the next one pretty soon? You know, it's not only funny, it's actually unintelligible and there's no connection between what you hear at the end and what the person said at the beginning. I mean, is that what the New Testament itself is? Hearsay upon hearsay upon hearsay. Well, you know, not sure, uh, we might say. Or, or, or we look at the New Testament, we go, well, I mean, maybe this is kind of dr- dreaming, wish fulfillment of a community of people that really want to believe good things about the world. And so they, they develop these legends and they kind of read those legends back into the past and they make it sound like it's history, but it really never actually happened. Or and maybe this is kind of a marginalized little community within Judaism under the oppression of Roman rule and they, 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 wanna, they need a narrative, kind of a grand meta-narrative that kind of helps them understand their place in the world and gives them some sense of empowerment against these forces. And so they come up with this story they call the gospel. I mean, it's possible. It is possible. And we have to honor that possibility. And I believe that Luke is doing just that. So you see Luke trying to figure out what happened. He, and notice he's doing the work. I investigated everything carefully from the very first. I mean, it's a little surprising to see that in the New Testament, right? Because he, he's assuming that smart people wouldn't necessarily embrace this strange tale that he's telling, right? People who are educated are gonna have a hard time uh, swallowing all these claims that I'm about to make in my, in my life. I get that, but I'm, so I'm gonna press through, and I've had to press through for myself, and I'm now pressing through for you, Theophilus, and Theophilus is going, yeah, press on, brother, because these are extraordinary claims, and I wanna really follow your investigation and see what it yields, so what happened? 
And we see this, if you, if you have the book open, you might just look again at what we read. Um, verse one, Luke defines his project. I want to, my project, an orderly account of events. Verse two, he identifies his sources. Eyewitnesses. By the way, we know that Luke was using written sources as well as oral uh, sources. But they were eyewitnesses. In verse three, he describes his process. I investigated everything carefully. You know, I took nothing for granted. I, I, I kicked the tires on this claim. And then in verse four, he states that the purpose of this, so that you may know the truth. And I just want to double click on that word truth because the, the original word he uses means firmness, security, reliability. You see, Luke uses the same word again in, in Acts chapter five, verse 23, where it refers to a lock on a door. I, I, I'm, I'm doing this investigation, Theophilus, so that you, maybe first so that I, and then so that you could have firmness, security, reliability. Investigate your faith. Investigate your faith. Okay, so what would that mean to do? Well, it would mean don't dive into yourself with sentimentality or credulity. You know how Mark Twain goes, faith is believing what you know ain't so. Well, Luke doesn't believe that. Uh, Luke believes in actual data and facts. And, and so uh, w uh, it's interesting for us, we, don't, we think of faith and facts as kind of opposite, but not for, for Luke. You need facts to have faith. That's, what, that's the implication of this. And so what do you do if you want to investigate your faith? Well, it, you would do what Theophilus is doing with Luke. You would inform your belief with the facts. You would investigate, you would look into it. You'd ask the question, well, what really happened? All right, so how could we do that with the New Testament? How can we get behind this text to know what really happened? That's a good question. I'd love for you to wrestle with that a little bit. And I'm not gonna answer the question for you, but if you'll give me a moment, a few moments, I'm gonna race through five types of questions that modern contemporary historians ask about any ancient doc document. Okay, I'm gonna give you five types of questions. I'm just gonna whet your appetite and then I'm gonna give you a book recommendation at the end. If you're still curious, you can look further, but I'm not gonna answer it for now. But here are the five types of questions I'll just give you initially and then I'll walk through them. Sources, dating, documentation, corroboration, and bias. Five types of questions. Okay, first, sources. You wanna ask the question, well, how good are these documents? I'm saying look at the documents as history. Set aside the, the claim that they're sacred texts, just as history, and ask, how good are the sources here? Well, Luke tells us I'm working with eyewitnesses, uh, those who are immediately involved, those who cared about the accuracy. He says, I investigated everything carefully from the first. If you're a lawyer, you understand this. He's, he set a very high evidentiary burden for himself. I'm not gonna believe anything. Uh, are the sources good? He says, yes. Uh, this is, by the way, what the New Testament writers say in general about their sources. They seem to really care about this. So John, uh, the, another apostle, he says, we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at, touched with our hands. First John 1, 1. Paul, same thing. He goes, if Christ has not been raised, if it didn't actually happen, then your faith is futile and you're in your sins still. And we of all people are most to be pitied, he says. So sources are really important to these folks. And they're saying they have good sources. Secondly, dating. How close in time is the writer as they write to the sources as they actually happen? Just for comparison, Alexander the Great, the, the time gap is 400 years. The major biography of Alexander the Great, 400 years between when he lived and when the writer wrote the fullest biography of him. The earliest reference, uh, textual reference to Alexander the Great is 120 years, so lo pretty long time. The New Testament, how, how tight is that gap? 15, uh, 20 to 50 years. The New Testament documents are, are just decades after Jesus rose from the dead. And, and some of them, some parts of them are as early as five years. So the, the documentation, uh, the dating is very close in the New Testament. Documentation, thirdly. How accurate are the manuscripts? Because we don't have the original documents, but we have copies of the documents, and this is true for all historical texts. Um, one writer says that the New Testament itself is the best attested set of documents in all of classical history. For Alexander the Great, there are 36 manuscripts that are all copied from one that dates 1,000 years from the original. In the New Testament, there are 5,200 Greek, and I'm being conservative, Greek manuscripts, wide geographical distribution around the Mediterranean Sea as early as 8,200. It's much, many more documents, much closer to the writing documentation. Number four, corroboration. 
how do these texts and what they say fit in with the external evidence or the picture that historians have of that period outside of them? And we find the writers with a lot of detail that fits the historical picture really well. Names, rulers, regions, dates. Luke, for example, writes in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was ruler of Galilee. And you can check all that out. Check, 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 check. Archaeological finds seem to support. We have remains of synagogues, particularly in Capernaum, Galilee, where Jesus was. A whole boat that's been unearthed recently from the Sea of Galilee, just like they uh, fished in. And we have the, a bone, a heel bone with a spike in it, a Roman nail, uh, evidently the product of a crucifixion. Uh, so it shows that crucifixions are very consistent with what happened at that time. Uh, the Roman uh, historian Tacitus, ref then, there's, then there are written records, records, okay? Did you know that the New Testament isn't the only record we have of Jesus, that there are other contemporary historians who are writing and make reference to Jesus? For example, Tacitus, he refers to Christians and, quote, Christus. He thinks that's the name, he, he misspells it. Christus, who had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. That's uh, the first century. Another first century historian, this one Jewish, Josephus, also refers to, quote, Jesus, a wise man who, brought, who wrought surprising feats and won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. Pilate had condemned him to be crucified. Uh, Josephus makes le several references, actually, to the Christian movement. Uh, that's also the first century corroboration. He said, okay, we can look at other things outside the New Testament. Lastly, bias. Is the account distorted by self-interest? Does it seem to be? Well, the New Testament authors, most of them were killed for their faith uh, and helped them to, too much self-interest there. And then when you kind of look at the character of the book, you see they, they, there are things that are in there that wouldn't seem to be there if it were made up, if it were a fabrication. For example, the, the disciples come off really poorly when you read the book. I don't know if you'll see that. They're like, the, these are the leaders of the movement and they're like really having a hard time. You know, Peter denies Jesus and he's gonna be the head of the church. You're like, what? You wouldn't, you wouldn't tell that story if you were making it up. Or the role of women, and it's really surprising to us. It's like shocking today, but for them, women couldn't even testify in court. So no one would care what a woman say. Why would you have women, the first witnesses to the resurrection? Why would they have this important role in the eyes of Jesus in the early church if, uh, if you were making it up? Uh, or also, there's just some, some details uh, that are in the text. That are, there's some differences from one perspective to another. And if you, if you were making it up, you'd kind of, when you sort of harmonize those differences, so it's all sort of exactly the same, but that's not happened in the New Testament. All, all of these taken together suggest, now there's probably, it's hard to see evidence of bias. And let me net this out. I quoted Christopher Hitchens earlier on one side of this. Here's another uh, scholar who's a, actually one of the foremost scholars today on the historicity of the New Testament. He's in Germany, in Berlin. And he writes this, in recent research, one can discern a clear tendency to grant the gospels the status of historical sources. This signifies a turning point. He's saying this is something new in Jesus' research to the extent that they were denied this status for quite some time. This is 2013. They are perceived as narratives that are interwoven in diverse ways with the underlying events of the life and fate of Jesus of Nazareth. That's Jens Schroeder from Jesus to the New Testament. So it sounds like Dr. Schroeder is sitting with Luke. He's sitting in belief. I investigated. And we need to do the same thing. We need to sit there too. We need to investigate our faith, investigate your faith. By the way, can I just say there's no better way to do that. If you're sincere about that and eager to do that, than to read a little bit. And I'm gonna recommend two books. The first one is John Dixon, Is Jesus History? Uh, he's an Australian historian, and this is a, this is a, a very accessible book. It's brief, and it's, it's easy to read, and, but it will open up to you some of the scholars. It's got a great bibliography. So John Dixon is Jesus' history. And then the other book you probably should start reading first, and that is the New Testament itself. <laughs> right? so, I, mean, that, that, I would start there. And um, we are doing that as a church, but you don't have to be a member of the church to do this. Uh, you don't even have to, have to show up, but we would love to encourage you to just start reading the book. You're going you're gonna to be surprised by what's in there. And so we call this Immerse, and um, you can do it with us in groups online or in person, or you can do it on your own. If you want more information about this, uh, come to upc.org slash Immerse, and it's a great, very accurate, readable transition, translation that we're using, and we'd encourage you to read that. All right. That's Theophilus and Luke.
That's the, it is a conversation, isn't it? It's a conversation between our unbelief and our belief. Some part of us sits with Theophilus, some part of us sits with Luke. And so let me finally ask, you know, what would, what would these two friends say to the person who sent me that email? Say, remember, I'm just hanging on, I'm just barely hanging on. What do you think they would say to him? And I wondered as I was thinking about that question, would they say what Flannery O'Connor said to a friend in, in a letter that she wrote? Do you remember Fran, Flannery O'Connor, this great American author and essayist, fiction writer? She says, let me tell you this, faith comes and goes. It rises and falls like the tides of an invisible ocean. If it's presumptuous to think that faith will stay with you forever, it's just as presumptuous to think that unbelief will. Hmm, Flannery O'Connor. Well, here's what I believe. You know, I didn't grow up reading this book. I didn't grow up asking the question, is the New Testament trustworthy? I, I didn't ask that question until well after I had come to faith. But I remember my first encounter with this book. I'll never forget it. I was filled with questions and I asked a friend. And this friend was the first person I ever knew having met who would go, okay, well, that's a good question. Let me just... And he'd go, let me read something to you. I was like, what? I knew that the book was a super old book. I thought it was like this crusty, rusty old book that no one, that had been superseded by science and you know, contemporary thinking and we didn't need it anymore. And all of a sudden he's answering my questions by reading from this book that's thousands of years old. It freaked me out. It was like the book was speaking to me. Someone was, and there was, no, it's not the book. It's someone. Right? There's a someone who, through the book, is speaking to me. And that's when I, I learned not to take my belief or unbelief all too seriously. Because our faith, ultimately, it's not in a book. It's in a person. And this book, both the Old Testament and the New, always testify to this person, Jesus Christ, the living center, the word of God. And we never read this book alone. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for giving us a book because we thank you for your voice in our lives, how eager we are to hear a voice of truth, of goodness, of beauty that comes into our lives from beyond our lives. We pray that as we read this book, we'll have a sense of the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who always walks with us through its pages. Christ's name we pray, amen.